I didn't actually record it, right? Uh, <laughs> it's I'll be back. You're here. It's going to be like a much tighter start now, isn't it? Because I'm just going to get into it. So, yes, this is I'll be back. If you've never been here before, this is all about the intersection of blah, blah, blah. I just said that. What you will notice, though, what you will notice straight away for some of you who are, have been regulars, and thank you very much for being loyal, I'll be back regulars. What you will notice is that I haven't got a back, I haven't got a green screen background today. I've decided to, uh, I've decided to hardwire the computer. I just found upstairs in my little green screen office that it's just the technology is a bit dicky sometimes. So I don't want to risk anything with uh, James coming in all the way from um, from Utah. So I've got so you're in. It's, it's, it's the Norton living room where I barely revealed. But it also means I can wear this kind of hat. Although my mother-in-law said I look like um, Perry from, uh, was that <laughs> Harry Enfield? <laughs> but I don't know. But you can't wear it on a green screen because if you do, yeah, actually it projects onto the hat, which is kind of weird and psychedelic and weird. But there you go. Um, so, yes, welcome to everybody here. Got a great, we've got a great um, event. We've got uh, James Chadwick, CC, co-founder and CCO of Pencil, all the way from... I'm going to say, James, snowy Utah. Yep, that's it. Snowy Utah. And of course, and then we've also got, um, we've got Mr. Top 50 Retail Innovation Influencer in the, influencer in the world. It's the mighty fine Mr. <laughs> Lister himself. How are you today, sir? I'm all right, thank you. I'm coming all the way from sunny Solihull in the West Midlands. Not as, glamorous, not as glamorous as James there over in Utah. Well, it's a mindset <laughs> thing, isn't it? If you think Solihull's glamorous and it is glamorous. So this is what's going to happen today. Oh, by the way, congratulations to those of you who won this at the last I'll be back. We gave three of these away as prizes and three of you won them. Hopefully they arrived. I think they did. I also think that Simon Hughes, I think he also autographed them. I will say that your book has gone up in value because it's actually been nominated for a um, Cricket Society Book of the Year, believe it or not. It got nominated, I think, last week. <laughs> And I said to Simon Hughes, I said, oh, brilliant. When, when's the award show? And he said, one year from now. <laughs> Which seems to me a very long time to wait for a possible award. But hey, that's all cool. So um, I will say, we've been so mad in our world. We haven't, um, I, we were kind of thinking about a prize, but I, I th we'll save it for the next one. I will say, Kerry, um, before we get cracking, the next one, because of what goes on in the UK, could it be a hybrid? I'll be back. I don't know, maybe that would be cool. Only if you've had a vaccine. Yeah, because I'm thinking about it. We haven't actually done a physical I'll be back in a room since oh god, I think February 2020, maybe? Mm. Maybe. Yeah, probably. did we even do the February one? We we had to was... Yeah, we we pulled one in March. I will say, of course, yeah, lots of, one, I'm sure lots of you, lots of you, lots of you. What have you done? Lots of you, obviously, um, uh, getting out and about, certainly UK now, you're meeting friends in sixes or whatever the rules are. Personally, I hope we stay doing it like this because I, I have become, as you well know, okay, I've become like a proper agrophobic now. So I just <laughs> like to stay in, in one or two rooms and basically survive by consuming my body weight in this every single day, frankly. <laughs> I've never felt better. You've, got, never you've felt... got to get back out there. You've got to get back out there. I can't do it, man. I've got proper... I, I, was out, I was out on Monday. I went out for the first day to check out some retail. And I, and I went to, to this retail park and there was a queue outside Primark of 400 people. No. Yeah. Of which, I must admit, I didn't get in the queue. There wasn't any fast fashion I wanted from Primark. Yeah. Um, but I must admit, I was astounded. But do you know what? Fair play. These people have been stuck indoors for months. They wanted to be a retail therapy. Right. Well, before we get yeah, on, I get yeah. that does that does that, that does need a little bit of unpacking. If there were four hundred people, and were they following the government's the social distancing rules? Yeah. Because that would be uh, like two yeah, miles I've, long. I've got to be honest with you. It was all very civil, and everyone had masks on, and it was all being sort of like marshalled around. And so I just needed to get back out there and start going into some retail spaces. So yeah, I was a bit of a geek. Went out first day, first hour. Wow. Well, we'll be hearing more about that later later <laughs> on. No doubt. Brilliant. So um. Well, you've heard enough of me yabbering on and that. You've seen the setter, if you're new to it. We're really delighted you're here. Uh, I will say that we do record this, so if there's anything you miss or whatever, or you want to tell your friend, you can go on to the Tiny Giants YouTube channel and watch it again. Watch it over and over and over as many times as you wish. But I think uh, right now, without further ado, it seems like a good time to hand over to uh, James, if you're ready to present, sir. Uh, I'll just say very quickly, James is the co-founder and CCO of Pencil, uh, pencil, but they're a creative agency, a creative AI agency who are doing some really um, 
mad, weird, interesting, wild, fantastic things. Uh, and, you know, we've kept, we've kept an eye on you, James, and, and Pencil for two or three years now to see what you've been. We've been aware of you, and it's really um, cool and uh, brilliant that you've come on today to tell us more about the Pencil story. So um, the floor is yours, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Great to meet everyone. Um, uh, as Milt mentioned, I'm based in uh, snowy Utah. So I'm in a place called Park City. We have nine ski resorts open within about 45 minutes. So uh, uh, it's snowy season here, but we're also famous here in Utah for our canyons. So you may have been to some of the canyons before on previous holidays. Um, my memories of Western Supermare is uh, that's where we used to go for rugby pre-season training. So uh, my memories of Western Supermare were, were running up and down that beach and kind of vomiting kind of uh, uh, pre-season. Oh, that's a typical experience in Western Supermare, yeah. vomiting. <laughs> Definitely. Um, which is what we uh, what we do, what we've built. We're not an agency. Um, we are a uh, uh, we're a tool. We're a B two B SaaS tool that people can sign up for and use to make their own Facebook and Instagram video ads. Uh, and uh, I would love to tell you all about that. Let me just start by showing you the kinds of um, ads we're talking about. So this is, uh, these are the kinds of ads that we make. So they are six seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, hardworking performance video ads for Facebook and Instagram, which uh, as you probably know is a, is a 70 to kind of $80 billion marketplace for, for advertising. Um, and uh, these are three of the hundred or so uh, brands and agencies that are now using Pencil. Um, a little bit about myself and our team. So uh, you know, we've, been, we've been going about three years. We believe that AI will be as fundamental to the creative process in the future as the Pencil was in the past. That's how we got the name Pencil. Uh, I worked at Facebook for seven years um, uh, both in the UK, uh, where I ran the pan-European team, and then uh, uh, in the States. I moved to Palo Alto in the States um, and, uh, and worked there. And then Will and Summer Kovacci, um, they, they founded uh, Pencil three years ago, uh, and they're both machine learning engineers. Summit was at Google, uh, where he ran machine learning engineering teams, and, and Will um, uh, uh, actually studied machine learning and, and systems engineering at, at Cambridge and then was in the world of advertising before doing this. Uh, we, and we have some great investors, including Sequoia, uh, who are very helpful to us. So the difference about Pencil, uh, and we're the only people doing this at the moment, is that we generate ads that learn to perform. So uh, there's a, an efficiency gain from the fact that the, all, the generation of the ads is automatic. Once you've set it up, you hit a button, and it would start generating as many ads as you need. Uh, but then also you connect, for those of you who have run ads on Facebook, we connect Pencil to your Facebook ads manager. And so that when you build the ads, you run them in Facebook, and then the data comes back over the API, back into Pencil, and then it trains Pencil to make better and better ads for you. So week on week, your ads get better uh, over time, the more you use it, the better they get. Okay, let me just show you how you actually make those ads. It's really simple. Any of us can do it. You put in your colors, your fonts, your logo. You drop in your assets. So that could be, uh, you know, some product shots that you might have. It could be some video that you have. Could be a, a brand film. Could be a bit of UGC testimonial video. And then you put in a little bit of messaging but you don't need to put in so much messaging because uh, it's powered by GPT-3 from OpenAI, which you may have heard of, and this will generate more language for you. It's a very powerful uh, language AI. Uh, and so Pencil will just start creating new language for your brand and put those into your ads. We use this framework of ABC, attention, benefit, consideration. That's how we've built the model. Uh, and so, the ads will start coming through and they'll look like these. Um, so every time you hit the button, 
you'll get three ads like these. So if you hit the button 10 times, you'll get three ads to review. And each ad uh, uh, comes automatically in five different variations, size variations. So there'll be square ones, there'll be vertical ones, there'll be horizontal ones, four by fives, five by fours, um, and you'll have a lot to choose from. Um, and the human is always in control, right? Because you can't, you know, you can't just push things out there uh, without reviewing them. So you'll review the ads that you get. Uh, you'll pick the ones that uh, you're interested to run, and then you can edit them. So you can go in, you can change the language, you can make it shorter, longer, add music, take music away, uh, all those things. And then typically people choose, what we're trying to get people to do is uh, choose five or 10 ads every week to push them in Facebook. And some will work, some won't, but all of that signal will come back into Facebook and uh, train, uh, train Pencil to make better ads. Once you've spent about $10,000 or so um, it's not exact, it's different for different brands, but um, once you've spent that much uh, on your pencil ads, you'll start to see this, which is a prediction panel. So that will tell you, you know, we think that this ad is going to perform better than 75% of your previous ads, and here's why. And this actually shows, I, I guess, how pencil is learning. Because each of these ads, we see an ad, what Pencil sees is, is dozens and dozens of fields of data. Um, and it uses that data uh, to learn. Um, and so it'll pick up what's working, what isn't, and it'll give you more ads that use the variables that do work. Um, we have, uh, you know, we've run hundreds of campaigns. We've been able to analyze uh, what, how well it's working because we actually get to see inside all those ad accounts. We get to see the pencil ads, the non-pencil ads. And we can see that pencil ads on, in general are, are beating the non-pencil ads by about 17%. That some brands get 7x, actually one, one brand recently got 11x higher ROAS uh, than it previously had by using pencil ads. And we have some, uh, some brands that are spending, you know, a million dollars a month on Facebook uh, on pencil ads now. Uh, I will just show a few more slides and then I'd love to open it up for some questions. Um, for those of you that are running Facebook ads, you'll, you'll know that this is, it's always an interesting time running Facebook ads, but um, uh, especially at the moment um, with, with what's going on with iOS 14 and, and various other things, creative is the main driver of performance. Um, but uh, creative fatigue is a bigger problem than ever. So uh, people are putting in ads uh, and then you know, quite quickly those ads will likely fatigue um, and, and start performing less well. And what a lot of companies do is they, they actually kind of find it quite hard to make creative. So those ads might sit there for a month or so and the, the performance goes down. So you know, a lot of good agencies and, and uh, advertisers are, are trying to get this red line where you know, they put in different ads every week and keep their performance high that way. And that's what we recommend, but we're, we're actually trying to do one better. We're trying to do the purple line so that you're putting in ads every week, uh, but they, those ads are getting better and better, like the purple line you can see there. Um, I am going to uh, just show one more thing. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, affordable, I think, kind of solution. It's, it's $700 a month. And for that, people can generate unlimited ads. They can invite unlimited users. So you can have the whole agency or your whole team kind of using it. Um, and uh, it's an annual commitment, but we have a three month pilot. Um, and there's a full customer support team. Uh, and I said, people can generate unlimited ads and then they can use 25 ads a month. And if they need more, then they, they, those are kind of $30 each. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'll stop there and see what, see what questions people have got. Thank you. Well, I think, um, thanks so much, Jay. You there, Kerry? You there? Uh, yeah, I'm there. Yeah. 
So uh, with James on here, uh, oh man, that's, I've got, I've quite got a few questions actually. There's a whole bunch of questions, <laughs> and I'm sure uh, us as tiny giant, as like you know, people who've had a play and a dabble in amongst uh, open AI as well, um, GPT-2 and GPT-3. Yeah, there's some things. Um, so should we, uh, do you want to read some questions out there, Kerry? Because I'm conscious yeah. that, yeah. Uh, what have we got? So we've got a question from Keith who said, is it only the content that gets better or is it the targeting that gets better as well? So we don't manage the targeting. Um, uh, we just focus on making the ads. There's an interesting thing that like, you know, I, I joined Facebook in 2012 before we'd ever made a, a you know, we'd never made a single mobile ad back then. Um, and in the early days, you know, targeting and data was, was really important. Uh, <laughs> that was how you kind of got a lot of in, in, performance advantage. Um, these days in general, it's not always, but generally, you, you want to try to keep your audiences as broad as possible. And so you almost want to use your creative as your targeting. So uh, we, we, the people who are getting the best performance are trying to put in five, 10 different kinds of ads, a broad audience, uh, and let those different ads unlock new audiences. Because when, when Facebook, when you put in a new piece of ad, let's say the one we're looking at here, and then Facebook set, you know, pushes it in front of some people, and then, you know, some people start responding, you know, clicking on it, you know, maybe even buying. Then Facebook says, okay, I think I now know what kind of people like this ad. I can go off now and try and find more people like that for you. So in that way, you're letting the creative almost do the targeting for you. Your job is to kind of create as much different creative as possible. Cool. And then we've got a question from Sandra who's asking whether it, is the copy only generated in English or is it available in other languages as well? We only generate copy in English, um, but uh, what quite a lot of users are doing is they are generating the ads in English to kind of pencil things in English. Uh, and then when they go to edit them, if they want a French version or a German version or a Spanish version, they just kind of go in and they, there's not that much language so they can, just translate those phrases manually. Uh, it takes a few minutes. Sure. And are the ads silent? The ads are whatever you want them to be. So um, okay. if you dropped in a, a film, let's say, with piece of music, you know, 30 second film with, with some music in it, it'll take that dominant piece of music and use that as the backtrack, the soundtrack, unless you remove it. Um, and if you drop in a uh, let's say a piece of a testimonial with someone, you know, talking about the amazing kind of product and talking for a minute, it'll take that soundtrack uh, and kind of pull some language from that soundtrack. Um, but the reality is, is, is uh, sound has very, very little difference on performance, uh, as you probably know, on Facebook, because vast majority of people are, are sound off. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then um, Tariq's asked, what's the feedback that improves the ads with each iteration? Yeah, so um, remember we said that when you, uh, when you look at this ad, we see an ad, Pencil sees dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of fields of data, like the ones that you see there, right? It's got humans in, it's fast, it's slow, the CTA is at the beginning, at the end, you know, which template was used. Um, and so the, what if you run five or 10 of these every week, the data come, that comes back is saying number two and number four and number seven worked and the others didn't. And then Pencil is saying, okay, I think it looks like when we put humans in, that seems to work. So I'm gonna recommend you to use more humans uh, or, or you know, the, color and, the yellow color and the red color seem to work really well. I'm gonna recommend more ads with the yellow and the red. So that's the, the way that it learns. Great. And then um, my question was, are you, because at the moment you're in Facebook, are you moving out onto, or have you got plans to move out onto other social media platforms? So a lot of our users um, run their ads on Facebook and Instagram automatically. They push it into their Facebook ads account. Yeah. But they also export and they run the ads in other places. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so we have no plans to like connect up to the APIs of other platforms because the other APIs are not as strong and robust and granular as the Facebook one. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then what's the biggest challenge that you found using GPT-3? Um, we've had a really great experience with GPT-3. So when we were on GPT-2, about 65% of our language was usable, we could see by our users. Um, and the day that we kind of switched to GPT-3, um, that became about 95%. Um, so we have no real problems or challenges um, as, as users, like for, for me, the actual product and output of GPT-3 is, is fantastic. I can't fault it. Um, the engineers might have some more kind of you know, technical issues yeah. that they will hit along the way, uh, which I can't talk to. But yeah, we've had a great experience. It was, it was beyond all expectations when we switched it on. To be honest, Kerry, uh, you know, think of me as a copywriter. You get about 5% of cents out of me, don't you? <laughs> we, we, we've been using, GP, yeah, we've used the, we sort of played around in the beta um, version of GPT-3 and it was, it was, I remember when we first tried it, just, yeah, kind of blew my mind just how good it was. I was really a, There was an article, wasn't there, yeah, a couple of days ago on the, um, uh, for those of you who don't know about it, there is a, uh, a, a creative, uh, well, it was a tiny giant group, I think it was, I can't remember if it was that or the creative AI one. There was an article in the Guardian, you know, they always, every so often they have a little GPT-3 article. And they did one about two days ago saying this is the greatest writer in the world right now. And it sort of triggered, as you can imagine, with that sort of clickbait headline. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> we'd say, I'd say from experience, uh, you know, feel free to step in, Kerry, it's like, you know, two, two and a half, three years ago, when we were sort of getting started in the creative AI space, you know, we used to sort of do stuff with neural networks to get writing. We used to sort of laugh that it would write like a drunken sailor, James. And that was like the pleasure of it was now. GPT-3 just writes like a person. Mm. Only better. Oh. Oh, what we're amazed at is how funny it can be. I mean, it's it, it quite humorous and playful. Um, you know, we had uh, we have this dog this thing brand. It's a dog food brand. Um, in Australia, and they were using it, and, and they basically found through using Facebook ads, pencil Facebook ads, that um, when they talked about taste, the taste of the dog, then their ads performed better, which is crazy, right? Humans don't tend to taste the dog food themselves. Um, and then also they got this, um, uh, they got this line, which was like something like flatulence, Right, uh, you know, flatulence isn't funny or something. <laughs> uh, you know, and again, this 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 really worked. This line, we had a um, a Unilever brand. I think it was close up. Was it was a toothpaste brand, and they uh, ran a whole bunch of ads. And the highest performer was put a goddess in your mouth. <laughs> uh, you know, which is just a bit weird, but it's so. I think quirky can be really effective. It just stops mm. people, it kind of stands out. It's because all the face all the Facebook ads really are is they're just trailers for your website or, or for your offer, right? That you you don't buy the thing there. It's just kind of grabs you, it stops you and it, it brings you in to check something out. So yeah, the playfulness of GPT three is phenomenal. Sorry, my child my child's showing in the background, but I'll carry on anyway. Um who um there's a the question about who provides the visuals. Just one second, Tove. Um, who provides the visual, visuals? Do you work with a visual pool that the advertiser provides? I think what you said was that you upload your own visuals and your own um, video, but do, is, are there any visuals added of a similar ilk or is it all, is it literally just what you put in? It's what you put in, yeah. Okay. Um, we A lot of users put in stock footage themselves, right? And, and mm -hmm. we, in the past, we actually did have, um, you know, you could, you could upload from Unsplash or one of those kind of stock footage companies. Um, but the reality is, is that the ads, it's quite obvious what's stock footage. Um, and so it made people quite lazy and people, the ads tended just to look, they just kind of look like Canva or kind of, you know, promo ads, which you can get for 10 bucks a month, right? Um, this is more about actually creating really quite high quality uh, strong ads that you would have to pay quite a lot of money uh, for.
for an agency to develop dozens of these, a lot more than you know, thirty dollars per ad. Great, thank you. And then someone's asking, who are your punters? Are they in-house teams or agencies, or maybe a bit of both? Yeah, it's almost exactly 50-50. And so is we're agnostic. Okay. Um, working with agencies is fantastic because they use it on one client and then they get the hang of it and then they start using it across many. So that's a great um, audience. We love working with agencies. Um, and then what's really interesting, I think the question is, is, is if it is in-house, who is it? And I think many people assume it's like that this would be a tool that would be used by the creative team or the creative person. But actually, the people who seem to get it fastest, and I mean literally within 20, 30 minutes, they're making ads and they like the ads and they're running the ads, are the actual Facebook you know, media managers themselves. So whoever the person is that's running face, the Facebook account, they're often the only person that really knows what's going on. And they wake up in the morning and they look at the data and they say, oh, you know, I need three more ads and I want, I want to try some targeted more at women and I want to try some more on this benefit. And, and, you know, currently they might have to wait a week or two weeks to get those ads from someone and get sign off for the budget and everything. And now they can just make them themselves. Cool. I've got, I think there's one more. So you mentioned after $10,000 that you get feedback on what worked and how to improve. What's the typical monthly ad spend of your clients, just to give us a sort of feel? Um, yeah, so I think um, it's typically about, it's $10,000 a month or more. Um, but we are, you know, I think if, if, we do get a lot of demand and requests from people who are spending less, um, uh, you know, and, and want a waiting for, I guess, a lower cost version of pencil. $750 a month might be too much for them. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're working on that, uh, bringing, having a lower cost, kind of like a scaled down version um, uh, for people who are spending less than, let's say, you know, 10,000 bucks a month. That's uh, that's pretty much wow. Indeed. So, look, if I had a machine, James, that could do a little ripple and pull, because I, uh, you know, there's loads of questions. What I will say is, if you, they're obviously on the chat facility. If you've got anything else you'd like to, if you're about um, James for a little longer with us, feel free to, uh, you know, feel free to answer on there or or whatever. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. Do you think we should uh, should we hang up our uh, pencils, Kerry? If you see what I mean. We hang up our yeah, pencils it's really cool I'd, yeah I'd, I'd, maybe but I'd, I'd quite like to work with it i think it'd be a really interesting thing to use and wild i will say what happened to i, I got when pencil uh, this is the last thing i'll ask and then kerry's gonna kerry's gonna uh, you're gonna do your piece kerry you're gonna do a piece we're gonna do this because well, I, I, I was gonna do um a piece but then i think i don't want us to run over so i don't know whether we go straight to steve and then if there's any time i can always do my little it was, it's just a tiny giant thing i was just going to cover some things that we've been up to well if so you're ready because i want steve to have enough time and people to have questions and stuff so okay okay well i've got one quick question for james before we go so when pencils was about two or three years ago we have played more than two years ago it's more when you were there was i i seem to remember there was a thing that the guys were doing i want to know where everyone to like a dis, it was almost like you put in a, a word or two it was i'm sure i had the word unicorn like a, dis, a creative unicorn and it would just come up with conceptual ideas. Did that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Or have I lost the plot? Have I, have I eaten magic mushrooms? I, it rings a bell. I think they they did something called studio or something like that. Um, and I think you you know I think they did open up a little bit of the AI. I can't remember what. I don't, I'm not sure what it was on, but it would. You could go in and you could put in some two. Well, it was in the two, old, you put two in, things together and it would two words in, and then it created your concepts yeah and it was a lovely little elegant uh, solution um and i guess what that's evolved with gpt3 that's evolved into write your value proposition lines however you want to do it and then pencil will play with those and it will create many more for you i used to remember i used to sit and put like concrete and giraffe oh i'm, I'm gonna what will i get for this <laughs> and it used to just go well go away stupid man <laughs> anyway there we go kerry 
Uh, should we do Steve? You, uh, I re- yeah, I reckon do Steve because I, I think it would be good as one of our guest speakers. I can chat anytime. So um, yeah, so Steve, if we hand over to you, um, I think Nortz has already introduced you, but Steve is um, knows a hell of a lot about emerging tech and retail. He's um, a huge influence in the space, and yeah, I'm really excited about hearing the talk. So welcome, Steve, and uh, yeah, it's, it's all yours. Brilliant. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, um, uh, Kerry and, and, and thanks James, I really, really found that fascinating too because um, and for me I just really wanted to first of all you know introduce myself you know not did a little one at the beginning so you know this is always a bit where you get to this slide and you give a little you know introduction to yourself. Most of the time people don't really give a crap who you are or who I am but no, you know the last seven years eight years I've been working inside a global agency um, and nine months ago, I decided that I was going to start out on my own and start start my own business in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, who would have thought I would have been so stupid uh, to do such a thing? Um, but hey, paid off. A um, couple of weeks ago, I got named in the uh, in the global list of retail technology uh, uh, influences in the world, along with Amazon and and uh, and a bunch of other people huge pat on the back really for, for, for me to really to say you know was that gamble worth it I'm hugely passionate about you know retail and what's going on and I've worked with a bunch of brands I'm not going to even put them up you know all of them up but there's a flavor of there on a huge varieties of, of retail innovation pieces so hey look I've got 48 slides I've got 15 minutes and I'm looking at it and thinking to myself that's probably about 20 seconds a slide so I've got to get cracking on this so um I'm going to be you know, taking a look here. And I'm going to just set some scenes. You, you all know this, guys. You know, you know, retail has, has been absolutely pummeled in the last 12, 18 months. If you think Asia closed down before sort of like Europe and then America closed down. And my all, all my, you know, retail brands and, and the clients and, and customers I'm working with have suffered hugely. You know, we've seen it, you know, you know, even if you if you look now down somewhere like Regent Street, are those flagship stores ever going to open? A lot of them are never going to open again. So the brands are having to, at the moment, really sort of like look at themselves and say to themselves, how do I now start to connect with my, you know, you know, with my customers that I used to in the past? Is it going to be physical or is it going to be or is it going to be digital? You know, and you know, they're closing down. We are losing so many of these businesses. We all know that. You, you've only got to walk down a high street and see the, the amount of people, you know, and, 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 and shops that are, and retail outlets that are closing. Some of them, I'm really glad that they've closed, you know, because retail has become boring and, and, and these massive department stores, the department store format is dead. We know it's dead. It, the shopping mall format in America is dead, um, has been dying for many, many years. And I think we've only really got John Lewis left and, and look at them. I mean, you know, they're, they're, you know, struggling and Hey, I just, I went to the new next in Foss park, the, the brand new one that was open this week. Next seemed to be turning themselves into the next department store, you know, very, very different department store that they've opened or, or store they've opened up in Foss park. It's got a virgin travel concession and it's got water stones in here. Um, it's got loads of different things inside it. So next seemed to be the one that are taking it into a different, so as things die, some things are reborn. Who would have thought 18 months ago or 12 months ago, the lowly QR code would be where it is now in these, you know, uh, 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 areas where, you know, people use it for everything. It was dead. Whoever used a QR code be- before the pandemic, very few of us, but now it's the non-touch way for, for people to be able to connect, you know, with brands, with retailers, with promotions, with campaigns. So we've seen brands really now struggling to go, am I physical? Am I digital? You know, should I go live streaming? Some people have done it very well. Some images I'm going to show you, you might look at and think, you know, you're trying to, how do you sell a a thousand pound handbag over a live streaming uh, service? But again, it's about keeping things relevant, keeping it fresh, keeping trying to connect with people and, and the consumers. So we've seen some neat ideas. But what we also have seen is retail starting to say things like this, browse with your eyes only. You know, imagine going into a store, you're not allowed to touch anything. You're not allowed to pick it up. You're not allowed to try it on. Well, what's the point of a physical store then? If you can only look at it with your eyes, you might as well just go online and order it, have it delivered the next day, try it on. If you don't like it, send it back for free. So there is all these things battling around, you know, what I'm seeing and people are really trying to work out about 
how they're going to keep this their brand relevant you know and and like james was saying you know these ads these creative ads that are hitting new markets you know getting that engagement that's where you know it is at the moment but as physical opens back up people are going to have to start to come up with different models and different ways to do it especially if you look at the beauty sector now if you look at the beauty sector i've been doing a lot of work with boots i'm doing some work with um the body shop at the moment now you can't try anything on you can't do anything you know uh, there's no testers they've all been taken off you can't have any demonstrations anymore in store so if you've got massive massive assets you know that are out there in the physical world when are they going to open up could be weeks could be months different part of the world so it could actually might even be years so we're seeing some really good uh, and some different ideas about you know these different creativities. Chanel are now trying on this this new area where it's you know as you've seen it before you know virtual try-ons, matching it with colours of different you know bags or or different things. It just creates that interactivity. Now we're seeing that brands are realising that this is, and I'm only going to say it once. Um, this is probably going to be the new normal. And then if, if I say it any more after that, you've got to shout and say, Steve, don't ever use that new normal ever again. Um, but other brands are starting to get a little bit more creative about it. This is a bespoke uh, lipstick brand, uh, uh, Bite Beauty, and they've got a virtual lab. And what they do is they set all this up for, cust for, for, for customers. And when you sign up, they send you out a pack with all the things that you want and what you, you know, the colors that you like with the little brushes and everything. And then you log on and then you can go through, you know, and have a tu tuition about what you've been sent in. So it's physical and then it's going to go online and then you can go on a big group. You've got the guy on the top left hand side. He's going to tell you about how to put things on, what the different shades, the different colors. So they're being creative right from the beginning about using the physicality of the product and the limitations of the physical world at the moment and taking it more to a, an online experience. Burberry have now got a virtual studio, beauty studio, where you can start to really look at AR technology and experiences the way it recognizes, you know, different faces, different tones, different shades. And, you know, they are really looking at this to now say, well, OK, this is it. This will break it down. And then you can start to look at the products which are specifically for you, your skin tone, your skin type. So again, it's completely now taking them away from having a physical asset in store. Will they ever return to that physical asset? Maybe only in a few areas. They probably will shut down most of them and move to this, you know, this more of this, uh, you know, virtual studio. Really neat way of, of doing it and, and a very, very different way we've seen. Now, if you're a fashion brand, Balenciaga, well, how do you do that if you're not allowed to go into stores? I'm sure... Um, Nortz has got his whole of his wardrobe with Balenciaga stuff in. I think that's a Balenciaga hat you've got on, isn't it, Nortz? I think it is. It's four hundred dollars. It costs oh. <laughs> four so, pounds. Four. So if you can't do anything, you know, in a physical world or catwalks, what do you do? Well, Balenciaga is now going to put their fashion collection into a video game, into Afterworld. So they're going to start to put their fashion out into sort of like this these, these areas to sort of like to connect with you know different consumers you know in fact that jacket there that nice furry yellow one i've just placed an order for that one i think i'll look pretty good at that in solihull high street but that's the way we're seeing people having to do it it's that physical presence you know which is which has gone so if you're someone like a vans you've got all of these shops all of these physical shops that are all shut all in different places around the world uh, Vans decided to convert their flagship store into a radio broadcasting center so they could then, you know, create an area for people to come to use the space while everyone is off. And again, creating this whole sort of like live from Vans New York, you know, uh, radio station. And this has just accelerated people's thinking. So, so for, for me, as a person that works with a bro real broad range of, of, of global brands and retailers, they're starting to really start to look at different areas. It could be grocery, it could be fashion, could be beauty. And they're really quite struggling. So if we sort of like, you know, take a look across into the, into sort of like this, this physical grocery uh, type world where, you know, I do spend, you know, a lot of my time, we can't touch stuff. You know, we've got masks on, you know, who's going to go up to stuff now and start touching it? Very, very few. But people have reacted it quite quickly. This was a, um, a, a new display that we saw uh, launched into one of the shopping centers where now this is like non-touch screens 
So you don't even have to touch these screens now to be able to, you know, they're just pure gesture control, you know, uh, to these displays. And this is now, you can now see this where all of the, the brands before were having these beautiful touch screens where now people are very, very reluctant to go up and start touching the screens, especially if you look at McDonald's. I mean, whoever thought touch screens in McDonald's were ever going to be a great idea, you know, after a pandemic, you know, who wants to go in and start touching, touching those sorts of areas? Now, we've started now to see this is one that's been uh, been trialed uh, uh, by, uh, well, many brands, but Coke's looking at this is a, um, a, a, a visual non touch vending machine driven purely by vision and by your eyes. So you can select the product, you can you can select it, you can then take it down and pay for it. And then all you've got to do is you tap and, and your product drops out the bottom. So we've moved from touching, we've moved from non-touch, we've now going on to, to visual uh, uh, connectivity, even with uh, things like vending machines, which is fascinating from our point. And then the last couple of slides on this piece is, all of a sudden now you're then looking at, now this is a vending machine that has an optical sensor. This vending machine counts the people going by, it will track age and gender, it will then change the content on the front of the screen based upon who's walking past. It will then pump out uh, product recommendations based upon those people and, the, and the, the consumers that are in front of it. And it will obviously learn from that and take the shopping behaviors and put the, shop, uh, the, the products that it, it sees that's right for the demographic of people that are around it. So they're taking all of that technologies and just putting it into something as simple as a vending machine. Now, if you then start to put facial recognition into it, if you then start to put other uh, recognition systems into these, uh, we even saw the other day uh, prescription-based products can be picked up from, from vending machines now by facial recognition, connecting it to your prescription, paying for it through you know, either face pay or, or, or uh, contactless. So again, technology is getting to this point where you know, they're really starting to understand and track age, mood and gender, even in something like um, a vending machine. We've seen Heineken sending out virtual beers while bars, restaurants and cafes are shut, just simply sending out beer mats to people, simple QR, AI, you know, uh, type uh, uh, products. This was, you know, send people a beer in lockdown, have a virtual beer on me. Um, this one announced this week, uh, Domino's in Houston have now got uh, autonomous delivery vehicle being tested in, in, in Houston. Um, you know, we've all seen the, 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 little, um, the little delivery ones in, um, in Milton Keynes. This is now going bigger. These guys are testing it. Will this ever be really launched on a mass scale? Who knows? Probably, probably will. They'll get it right and it will, it, will move, it will move forward. And we've seen a real rise of things like, you know, retail robots. This is Peppa. I don't know if you guys have seen her before. She'll lead you around store wherever you want to go. I saw one of these where one of these got employed on a Monday and they fired it on a Friday because it wasn't as good as they thought it was going to be. So I think it was the first world first retail robot that was hired in one week and it was fired on the Friday because it was just uh, not what they were looking for. But there are other things that are happening. We're now seeing retail robots leading you. This is one in Lowe's in America, a big DIY store. You type in what you're looking for and it'll actually lead you through a physical environment and take you right to the bay that you're looking for the products. We're also saying things like eye beacons now as you walk past stores, pumping out time-based discounts. So, you know, you've got 30% off in 30 minutes. And if you don't do it, it's 29 minutes, 20% off, 25, you know, 15, 14, 13, you know, just anything to get that physicality of getting you from outside, inside and get you spending. And these were a couple of interesting things that we've been seeing, you know, taking sort of like the mobile in, in store, you know, this is being trialed by um, uh, Waitrose where your location of products is linked to your shopping list. Um, most females shop with a shopping list. Most males don't shop with a shopping list. That's why men are easier to sell impulse products to in grocery because we don't shop from a shopping list. But this is an interesting one from your shopping list. It even knows where you are in the store and tells you that you're eight feet away from your organic British strawberries. How good is that for impulse buying? I don't know. If you're just going to follow your shopping list around in and out, that's, that's the way people are looking at it. But this was an interesting one I saw. This was a big uh, store in America that you had your shopping list inserted, obviously, into your phone. 
but it then put an AI overlay over the top so you could look through your phone and it'll actually guide you through the store and take you to the different bays to exactly where your products were on your shopping list. So I, again, I thought it was quite an, an interesting way to, 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 to take not just a physical shopping list, but take it onto your mobile device and overlay a, a store a, a directional piece over the top of it. Just to a final few slides, you know, this is probably the most unimaginative retail robot you could ever design. I won't tell you what I think it looks like, but this is a stock counter. This basically is your stock control robot that can just be set off either during the day or in the, in the evening, and it will just count all of the stock on the shelves, notify the staff when the shelves are empty, and then notifies them what they need to put on. So quite an interesting uh, a, a way of using sort of like that technology in sort of like a stock count. But hey, what about this? This is your, this is your COVID cleaning robot. So your COVID cleaning robot sets itself off at night with all these UV lights on it, and it cleans the store before you get in the morning because COVID is killed by UV light. So, um, so there's loads of different ways that I'm seeing different areas taken from it. Voice is definitely now coming into stores. You know, we've seen the Ask Alexa piece being put into the Amazon stores, so you can ask Alexa in store where you're going. We're now seeing voice actually being put onto shelf. So this was a this was a smart aisle uh, installation where you could go up and talk to this whole shelf about whiskey. You could ask the different products, where they're from, what to blend them with. And again, the voice uh, Alexa voice would just take you through all of the different things. So again, voice has definitely come into the fray now and, and actually being used in retail uh, applications. I've just put Amazon Fresh up there. I've just put the Amazon Go stores, you know, for me, you know, I just wanted to finish on these. The technology behind this, I find absolutely fascinating. The only downside of this is it's hugely expensive, tens of millions of pounds to start putting this into any form of, you know, large store. But we are seeing it. I think Amazon, you know, I think it's well known that Amazon will start to put this out to other retailers and to take this whole scan, enter and just walk out just to let consumers be able to go in, you know, buy and walk out. One thing I will say is there are loads of, uh, of these new technologies coming out, Albert Hein in Holland. These, these are now standalone little stores where you go in with your app, you scan it, you go in, you buy, you walk straight out, you know, cashierless, you know, cashless, you can just go in and out. So there is a huge rush into this technology piece here where, you know, it's, it's a cashierless, you know, walk in, walk out technology. And I think that is 15 minutes from me. There was a lot of slides to throw at you, but I just wanted to end on this last one to say, technology now is flooding into retail and into the retail space. We've got movement trackers, we've got you know, projection mapping, lift and learn technologies, you know, augmented reality wayfinding, appointment booking. We've got, you name it, it is coming in. COVID has only acted as an accelerant to retail technologies that we've seen coming in. Things that were gonna take three years are now taking three months. So it's an exciting time to be in retail tech technology, um, hugely you know, focused on by, by clients at the moment. You know, I said to you at the beginning, you know, who gives a crap? I give a crap about retail technology because it's a really exciting time to be in it. Um, and if you invite me on again, I'll bring you another 28, 30 slides of some of the new stuff I'm seeing and some of the new innovations I'm seeing um, out, out of uh, the US and out of China as well. So thanks a lot, guys. That was my 15 minutes. Whoa, Kerry Harrison, what do you think about that then? What do you think about Steve? I'm going to do that and I'm going to give him some applause. <laughs> and we've got a couple of, we got a couple of questions. Uh, um, Steve, that's amazing. That's, what do you think, Kerry? What do you think of all that? Yeah, I thought, I thought it was great. I really liked it. I'd, um, yeah, there's quite a few questions and I've got a couple as well. Uh, I think one of the questions, which is a pretty good one, is if it's all about screens and no touch, what's what's the point of sort of bricks and mortar shops? That was from, uh, that's from Alan, that's from Alan Thorpe. Thanks for joining us today, Alan Thorpe. A first, a first timer, I believe, uh, I bet, or maybe not. Quite an existential it, question, Kerry. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of shops? <laughs> You're right. I, personally, in my opinion, I think stores are now just validation points. I think that's all they are. I think people will come. We've all done it. We've all gone in and looked at something, either touched it or just to confirm that that's what I wanted to buy. You know, 
and then you'll go off and do something else. You'll go out for the day, you'll have something to eat, you'll go back online later, you do a price check, and then you'll do it. So for me, stores are just the just validation points now. Okay. It, do you, is there any, are there any people, I think you mentioned the Vans one, any bricks and mortar stores that are, I know during COVID that it's not been easy to do that, but going forward, there will there be any that make it work for them? As in, will it be about creating experiences in the store to make people go in or like, do you know anyone that you think is going to absolutely smash it just in, just doing bricks and mortar? I, oh, it, you, you, I think, the, in my opinion, the bigger people get, the less creative they can ever become. You yeah. know, because if you look at someone like, you know, um, you know, a misguided who were, you know, famous started online, they've now entered the sort of like the physical world, but they'll only ever open up two or three shops. They might only, only ever open pop-up shops, right? Yeah. And, and, and do it with launches. You know, hey, we won't carry, you've only got to look at things like department stores, you know, they're dead. The format is dead. Right. They're unimaginative. People don't want to go to them anymore, you know. Uh, but I'm not saying that retail is dead. What I'm saying is retail just needs to make itself more exciting and, and more of an, uh, you know, the second word I hate to use is experience. Or experience. Mm. But give someone a reason to go into one and they will. People, yeah. humans still like to have that interactivity of something. The, the element of buying it at the end, the transactional point, I don't think anyone really gives a stuff where they actually purchase it anymore. Cool. And then I guess in a similar line to that, um, Kerry has asked us, it said, in areas of, of China, some of the retail shop spaces become almost dropping spaces for virtual experiences in support of the online experiences they're trying to give customers. Do you see this being the same in the UK, Europe for the longer term? Um, I'd say in the short term, yes. I mean, we're seeing there's, there's a company out there called souk.com, S-O-U-K.com. And they're, they, basically what they're doing is they're buying up empty stores and all they're putting into the stores are um, digital screens and, and having a digital space. And you can hire it by the hour. So you can have a pop-up shop really, really quick in a location in London. And you can literally, I, I know for a fact that Nike are maybe doing a deal with Souk. I might be wrong there, but I've heard that brands like that want to go into these pop-up physical shops, you know, and taking a look at that. But to answer uh, the question there is, I definitely think that we can look to the East and look at how they're blending their sort of like online with the physicality. And I definitely think, you know, we will learn from that and use it because, you know, they are definitely early adopters of, of, of new ways of, of retail technology. And we definitely see a lag before it comes here. It normally comes to England first and then back out to Europe and then, then comes back over from America. So it sort of bounces around different, er different countries first. Hey, I will say, Kerry, we of course have a... Uh... Uh, some of these amazing things that Steve has uh, touched upon today, we of course do have a we have a meeting tomorrow with a with a big brand, don't we, to brainstorm around it, which is all about creating their virtual world in effect, mm. because they don't, you know, it's exactly that same thing. And and when I've sort of seen and heard, it makes a lot more sense now having you put in front. Very timely that you should have well, should have done I'm, that. So um, I've got to say, yeah, I think I think moving into the gaming world is really interesting. I know you just touched on that, but it'd be interesting. You know, are there quite a lot of brands moving in that area because it feels like a really big space? I I think the one thing we uh, we were asked, I was asked about six months ago that if you look at something like Call of Duty, they've got so much detail. You can go into sort of like whole supermarkets. And, and how you know and, and and going there but there's nothing like that now why isn't there is it because there's loads of money in gaming and there's not in in that in that sort of in the space we're in we're definitely going to start to see some very creative ways of maybe creating virtual shops in a more gaming manner than we did before i mean hey look you've only got to go online onto my games my son plays call of duty and you can see the adverts and stuff in there and the way they're doing it if they brought out a call of duty for one of his brands and a plug-in he would go on it. He would do it. And that what a way to then embed that brand into, into a certain demographics of, of, of like gamers. But definitely gamification is something that I think we're going to see a lot of. Well, there was that thing, wasn't there? We, we talked about an, an older, uh, an, an album back this, this year at some point, or, or maybe last year, the thing slightly different where it was um, Burger King, wasn't it? Where they went into uh, FIFA, didn't they? And they, bas they basically sponsored I think it was Stevenage United in the real world. So but if you, why the hell is Burger King sponsored Steve, Stevenage United? But it meant that when Stevenage United are on FIFA, people were 
playing with Stevenage United because they get yeah. discounts and stuff because they had, so it's basically had the players in a virtual world running around advertising Burger King. It was like, oh, that's amazing. It, it is, and and I think we'll see more of that. I, th- I think I think what this has done is excel- it's accelerated creativity and, and and thinking as well. I think people have definitely realised that they cannot. And when I say short term, definitely in the next 12 to 18 months, retail is not going to be back to normal. COVID is going to be bouncing around and we're going to have spikes in different countries. And so so people can't now rely on if you've got a new if you've got a new brand coming out or a new product launch coming out or a new range of something coming out. You cannot rely on the physical world now to deliver it. So you've got to now think of different ways to deliver that. Amazing. Great. Just a couple more questions. Do you think that small sort of independent retailers can play in this kind of high tech world or is it really just for big brands right now? No, it's not. I, I, I think who, who, whoever can crack a really nice, easy solution for someone who is an independent. There is no doubt that the, the, the future of the retail of, 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 of retail, as in high streets, is independence we're going to go back to this people wanting to shop more local um you know am i going to go to london am i going to get on a train and go all the way to london to just do some shopping you know you know in a in a in a shop down there i won't do for a long time you know um i think if someone can crack a really easy solution to tell independent retailers to set up certain things i think i think if they can create a really nice little product that is easy to install and easy to do to get them online and to get them to maybe be more creative, I think that person I'll invest in. <laughs> more creativity, eh? Yeah. Amen. Oh, creativity good. is 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 the fuel. Cool. And then uh, just we've got loads, but I'll just ask one more. So um, Tariq's that saying that we can't speak for everyone, but I think many people still want to see and feel, you know, especially when it comes to buying food. And the pandemic, the pandemic's meant that a lot, a lot of people have spent the year picking terrible quality bits of things that have been delivered um i think for tech this is a tough area to crack you know do you do you agree with that kind of thing you know there are times when actually you just need to see and feel your you know what you're going to buy you're absolutely right whoever asked the question you're right if you just take it for in the uk in the uk we shop average three shops a, a, a week You'll go high end, you'll go middle, you'll go basic. You might go to Aldi or, 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 or Little to, to, to do your basics. You might go to Marks, Spencer's or Waitrose to get some premium products. If you then go to Italy or you go to France, it's very tactile. People like to shop in local. So it's going to be very different from country to country. So what you might find is people will buy their basic stuff now online, Ocado, whatever, you know, have it delivered you know, but then you'll do your little top up shop with the with the premium stuff. You want to go out and do a little bit more of a, a look and feel. But your potatoes and your carrots and your milk and your eggs and your cheese, just have that delivered. Why would you even go into a shop and buy that those sort of staple products? I, I don't know. I wouldn't. <laughs> Great. I think. Yeah, I think we've, I mean, we've got to wrap up because it's five. But um, yeah, th- th- there's a few other questions, but uh, obviously you can get in touch with Steve if you've got anything else that you'd like to ask. But I want um, to say, Got to say, Kerry, you can see why he's a top 50 retail <laughs> tech innovation <laughs> influencer. You can see it. It's a, By the way, Tarek, first time on today. I feel like a DJ. I can see you up there. Yeah. Just, we visit, We used to we met you once, Tarek, didn't we? In in the pervasive yeah, it's world. nice to see you. In those giddy days, giddy headed days, human contact. Well, you know me, Kerry. I, I, I just stay at home with my vitamin D, which I've had <laughs> <laughs> from my non touch <laughs> screen. If anyone's got any other questions, you know, look, you know, feed them through, you know, noughts or carry or just come straight to me. I'm on LinkedIn or whatever. Just 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 find me out somewhere and, uh, and you know, ask me a question. But yes, you said it. We didn't ask you. You said I'd be only too happy to come back again and we'll be taking you up on that offer, Steve. You, any yeah. Talk, yeah, definitely. Very noughts, anything for you guys. You you just ask it. I'll do it. I'll, I'm, I'll look glad to help. I've got to say, I think in, in my former job, Kerry, in my former job, uh, where we worked together and for a tiny child. The last kind of official thing I ever did uh, representing the business was with Steve yep. uh, in Amsterdam with Heineken. Oh my, oh my and there was God. a lot of physical beer drunk at that thing. And now, and now I see that Heineken just give out virtual beers. And, and hold a second, Nortz, we were voted the best, the, the best agency, the best supplier on that day. The best supplier that day, weren't we? Me and you presented and all that we malarkey. Did. And that, that, but now it's just virtual beers. You can't. They don't even have to brew a beer anymore. No, just send a virtual one. <laughs> Less calorific as well. I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> not as satisfying though, eh? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <Sorry, I'm joking. laughs>
Hey, <laughs> Kerry, you got you better you gonna you better land this bird, as they say. In yeah. So um. Yeah, we're, we're going to have to wrap up. So I, did, I didn't get to do mine, but I was going to talk about AI and art and some of the stuff we've been doing, but we'll talk about that next time. Um, plenty to talk about. So thanks everyone for coming. It's brilliant to see you. And yeah, thanks again to Steve and James. Um, brilliant presentations and really, really interesting stuff. So I'm sure you'll both get questions from, because I'm sure there's lots more. Um, so yeah, thanks to Derek, who's uh, doing all the controls and obviously Noughts. And um, yeah, have um, have a brilliant evening. And hey, we'll hey, i got one quick question for you, Kev. One quick question before we go. Uh, I know we haven't said we know we do these six weeks, don't we? Every six weeks, yeah. So we'll be back from my thinking, sort of the first week of June, something like that. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember um, the day. We, yeah, we'll be, we'll be back. You'll see. Yeah, we'll have to think about the roadmap, won't we? And how we can get the, the very best. Maybe perhaps we can have a non-touch. I'll be back, inspired by. Wouldn't that be amazing to have uh, a pen? You can have pencil AI generated ad on a vending machine. Yeah, but as you walk past an AI generated ad, that's that's whoa, come on, hey, James. Let's let's get it together and then let's go and sell it to Coke. <laughs> I think we should have an I'll be back in a, in a game in the gaming world now. You've talked about that as well, Steve. I've got I've got more ideas. If you want to do the, some gaming stuff, I've got some yeah. uh, great uh, stuff that I might be able to present then as well. Some some stuff I can't at the moment. Okay, yeah, we okay. Be, we have a plan, didn't we? We've had a plan we hatched about four months ago where we were going to do I'll be back in Roblox. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. But we just haven't really gone shit together in that front. It's just been busy. Stuff goes on, doesn't it, in your world. Have these plans. You've got to manifest them. Anyway, so, Kerry, say those sweet goodbyes to everyone. And, yeah, thank you, everybody. Anything else you'd like to add at this point? Are you talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Oh, no, I've said my bit. Oh, all yeah. right, fair dude. Right. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, James. Yeah, no, you this will be on YouTube uh, on our Tiny Giant channel if you want to um, If you want to have some... And of course you will, because frankly, it's all been pretty mad. I don't know why people don't nick those pizza delivery robots, though. That'd be my first... If, if I they're, came down the road... They're a little bit big. The smaller ones are all right. You could carry the ones in Milton Keynes away in your arms. Really? But... Just come out in a big thing, put it in the back. See ya! Got my pizza <laughs> robot. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so yeah, much. Guys. And uh, we'll see you at the um, next one. Next one. Yeah, about six weeks. Catch you later. Bye, everyone. See you, guys. Bye. See you, world. Thank you, Steve. Bye.